Okay, um, so welcome everybody. Um, tonight we are going to be um, hopefully finishing up our series on Turbo or SDXL Turbo. <clears throat> We've got a little more diffusion to finish, a um, little distillation, uh, and then we'll jump into the paper, which should be pretty quick because it's really a composition of um, the various technologies that we've been looking at. Um, so hopefully that'll go uh, relatively fast. So with that, I will um, share screen. Okay, did that come across okay, guys? Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, so um, this was a, uh, and tell me if the size and everything is okay. Is that visible? Um, yeah, you're good. Okay. Yeah, and okay. if you, and if it's okay with you to do the, what is it oh, called? Oh, presenter? Yes, presenter. Okay. Yeah, in the, Perfect, there thank you. you. Okay. Um, okay, so this was, <clears throat> I think the picture that captures most of what our discussion was last week, um, the diffusion model um, starts with uh, the a sample from the data. It does a forward um, uh, diffusion, or sto is, what is it, stochastic differential equation, where you add more and more noise to get to some prior distribution. So this column here represents the distribution of the data. This represents the distribution of the prior, which is kind of like the, I don't know, hidden state or, no, hidden state isn't the right term, but this is the fully noised um, data. And then the reverse SDE get, um, expressed uh, in this equation, you follow that to end up with the data, back to the data distribution. Um, and then also that Given an SDE, there's a corresponding um, ODE uh, that uses a score function. Um, I guess both of these are using the score function uh, to uh, run the reverse um, generation from a prior to a data sample. Is that right, Dave? Anything you would add to that? Just a quick summary of this is the main, the essence really of generative diffusion generative models, right? Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, this is exactly what uh, uh, it is. Uh, there was just a very small digression. I know last week this uh, discussion came up where what if one of the modes is condensed in on one side mm -hmm. and the other side is a wider uh, wider variance mode? Uh, will given that the schedule of noise is similar? of starting from your data to uh, to Gaussian. So what you would notice if you put two of up, two up such modes uh, in, in your data set on the left-hand side, and maybe let me use the pen so that I, since pen is much better for me than just talking, <laughs> if that's okay with everyone. Yeah, 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 go ahead. You're gonna have to teach me how to do this one day. Okay. so. I think his point was that what if one of the modes is uh, with wider variance, but the other one is tight. concentrated, yeah, tight like yep. this. Yep. And given that our noise schedule is same across when you start from here, right? Yeah. So uh, you would see a, a widening of your ODE trajectories, if you may, yep. uh, versus over here they will are coming out of all the places so it won't appear as sudden widening and that's because you have the similar uh, sigma t i think that's the point he was trying to make back then and uh, we were uh, figuring out exactly what that was so yes it will be like that and as you may notice sometimes you would see for example in this trajectory you know it has widened and then it has started kind of flattening out right so it might appear that it is like the trajectory that I'm trying to highlight with the black pen, maybe I should use a different ink. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how to change the ink, but let me just stay with that for now. So uh, they tend to maybe converge so that, not converge, but like bend, right? Like, so you may see with this kind of thing, it may come and then kind of appear bending at some inflection point here, right? So at the end, it has to follow the, uh, the, the, the marginal distribution at every time stamp t for yeah. the okay that's what i thought um we might take it offline i actually put a notebook together and started modeling this um, i didn't 
there was a glitch that didn't work, so I didn't uh, decided not to present it tonight. Um, but uh, maybe we can do it at a, at a later time. Just m modeling essentially this this process, or at least the forward process. Uh, yes. So if you got some time later on, we can collaborate on that and then present it. Okay. And that should show that we could show that. And the other one I want, Evita is not online tonight, but I wanted to also address, and that was the question: Does the ODE lines, ODE trajectory lines, represent um, essentially the mean of all the samples, the SDE samples from a given point? Um, I suspect that that's true, uh, but I want. I thought it'd be nice to to run the numbers and see if that's what it what it does. So, anyhow, we can. If you're up for it, Dave, we can do that another at another later. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. That okay. would be good exercise. Thanks. Good. Okay, so uh, these are the ODE lines. Um, I don't think the ODE lines. Now we can look at um, the the process of distillation from these ODE lines. This was an example of um, CM uh, consistency modeling. I think it is where you're trying to get multiple points along the trajectory mapping to the same um, data point um, over here. Um, one of the things that uh, no, I noted as I was going through this was um, this process of um, what is the, the loss function that you're trying to optimize. Um, it's the score function, where do you train that? Um, and this is the equation for the score function right, right now. Um, this was, I, I looked at it because um, it was kind of, it was interesting that you're, what you're trying to do is, is match the score function to the gradient uh, with respect to X of log of P of X, the distribution of, um, of X, P of X, oh, P T of X, so P, uh, P of X at a given time T. Um, so it's just a, that's what you're doing here. You're trying to get that to match the gradient log P. Um, Diffusion hey, Roger. Or, yeah. Real quick, the score function is the S of X of T? Correct. Yeah, this yeah, is S, a, S right? sigma, I'm sorry, so X of T. Yeah, okay. S of Thank T, you. yeah. And, and you're trying to uh, make it match this. So you want essentially sure. S score function to learn to be the gradient X log PT of X. Yeah, yeah. and then those, those two would go down to zero, and right? When right. I looked at the functions, it was kind of interesting because I tied it back to um, when you're doing uh, the noise canceling networks, you, you try to learn what is the noise. Um, and if you look at the function, the loop um, for training the score function, it ended up being kind of the same thing, which was a little surprising. Um, and I looked through and pardon the uh, cut and paste here, I should learn how to do equations. Um, so I've just got some cut and paste here, but this G of X is the equation for a Gaussian uh, PDF, okay? Um, and we're trying to learn this score function, um, which is the gradient with respect of X log PT of X. So that is essentially this gradient log of G of X. So log G of X, um, and this is going to be a little hand wavy, not really disciplined, but log G of X is going to be, you know, the log of this plus the log of this. Ignore this because we're going to take the gradient afterwards. So the, the log of the X of this is what's inside. Um, and then the gradient of that is through the chain rule is this. So basically um, the gradient, when you're adding Gaussian noise to a, a known data point, assume the data point is uh, in the distribution, when you're adding noise to it, essentially the gradient uh, log is the noise that you added, I guess normalized by sigma squared. I haven't cross checked that, but it, it looks like from this math, at least it's normalized by sigma squared. I thought that was kind of interesting. So that's how you get to where if learning gradient, um, the log P of X, learning the score function is basically learning the noise. What is the noise that um, you've added to the data sample? That is correct. And, and, and all that math simplifies so much. And that's why you end up uh, learning the noise because that is the simplest math to do. Right. Uh, and also the other thing, just for Jerry's point. Uh, so Jerry, uh, what we want to measure is score, which is in this slide in that uh, 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 on the uh, top left, this thing is the score, right? But the score function is our network. So what we are trying to do is build a network that can estimate this as close as possible. 
right? Okay. So you're, you're shooting for uh, uh, the, the two quantities to come to the same, well, Exactly. The and that's quantities, why, the distributions is, I guess, the more correct term. Correct. And uh, that's why yeah. the previous slide, the loss was the minimize the L, L2, I think. Law, yeah. The yeah, L2, L2 loss, loss, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Pushpa, you had a question? Yeah. Um, I kind of had more of a comment on the previous uh, topic of uh, uh, the solution of ODE being uh, the uh, kind of the average of. Uh, Okay. ST. So uh, generally, mm, my knowledge is that uh, ODE kind of is uh, more um, uh, a deterministic solution. So from an ODE equation, the solution that you would get is uh, 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 deterministic. That is, uh, once you know some initial conditions, like uh, the uh, Newton's equations, right? Like um, from our uh, high school, like uh, uh, if you know for any particle moving in a certain trajectory, you can find out the velocity at any time if you know its uh, initial velocity, uh, then we can find out at any time. So that's, a, that's an ODE. It's a solution of an ordinary differential equation and it is a deterministic. You will at any time get one solution. Right. Whereas in a uh, stochastic differential equation, um, the solution is more probabilistic. Uh, it's just stochastic uh, uh, solution. So at any point, you will get a probability uh, distribution. Right. 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 And, and, so, and it may not necessarily that uh, uh, the solution from ODE is a kind of mean of uh, the stochastic uh, um solution from the stochastic equation. And also uh, why we want to convert it to ODE is because it's much more <clears throat> easier to solve because the, now the equation becomes uh, more dis deterministic. That's why you see that uh, the lines of ODE are, more, are just smooth because at any time you just have one solution. It's not a probability distribution, yeah. Right. Great point. Uh, yes. And, and, uh, hey, Deb, sorry, just because I got to keep us on time because Roger can't finish this presentation next week and I can't finish it. So I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Just so we got to get to the actual SDXL turbo. Right. Sounds but, good. Yeah. And push but, um, so what, uh, Dave and I were talking about is, um, actually running kind of a simulation on this. Um, and we'll try to take that offline and come back with a, um, a meetup in the future and try to, answer exactly what you're saying. I, I, I think what you're saying is right. Um, we'll be able to dive into a little bit later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyhow, that was for me was kind of this equivalence and why that occurred was kind of interesting. Um, score function, I could just a couple of little slides. So the score function again is the gradient. So in this case, it's the color represents the density, probability density, and the score function you see is in this 2D example is, is a vector. Um, pointing at the high density, um, the, the nearest high densities. Um, I think we've already done this. Uh, one of the things that came up, somebody asked the question about um, uh, latent uh, uh, diffusion models. Um, the paper we're going to look at, actually, they, were, they ran it in image pixel space, not in latent space, which is kind of funny because um, I think a lot of stable diffusion um, is all done in, in latent space. But um, anyhow, so what does it mean to be diffusion in latent space? Um, the idea really is that when you're, it's primarily motivated by computational efficiency. Um, typically um, in the pixel space over here, you have, you know, so let's say 256 by 256. It's a large high dimensional space. Uh, and so running the diffusion, you have to run big models for each of these steps. Um, so the idea is if you can compress this down in a good, into a good representative um, space, into the latent space, you can run diffusion in the latent space and then um, project it back up into pixel space. And so this is the picture that I've seen. I think this was from little blog um, that captures that. So we have um, the pixel space projected down in latent space. And these, um, the projection is done by an encoder decoder that is trained separately. Um, and I'm not sure if it's actually VAE, um, probably a VAE that would be 
doing this training. Um, but here you're basically training a network that compresses into a lower space, expands it back into the pixel space, and then the loss function uh, I think is typically um, L2 squared or L2 loss between the generated model and the uh, the not generated I won't call it generated but the the expanded um, pix, uh, pixel space versus the original pixel space. These are then frozen in an LDM. These don't change. Um, and what you do is you run the same diffusion that you'd see otherwise, uh, where you're adding noise in this direction and you're removing noise in this direction um, using a UNet type of architecture. This one happens to also show um, how you can guide that diffusion using some sort of embedding. Um, it seems like that's one of the advantages. Dave, you might have a comment here, but one of the advantages of using diffusion models is it fits naturally to having this guidance of the generative side. You can um, use embeddings to kind of uh, cause the, the generation process to drift in the direction you want. Like, for instance, um, uh, guiding it towards matching a um, some sort of prompt text. Okay. Did, did I hear you right when you said the encoder and decoder are trained separately? Yes. That's my understanding is those are trained ahead of time. It's not part of the, the diffusion process. So is it possible that I can take, I make the round trip from the encoder, come back to the decoder, but be able to take out other things from the image that I would be interested in as okay. opposed to recreating it? I'm not sorry. I'm not sure I'm following the question. Um, because you said that train separately, right? So is it possible for me to look at, I encode, I go the left to right, the encoder route, then go to the ZT, come back, but in the decoder, try to get some other aspects of the image out, not just recreate it. That, that's what I mean. Oh yeah, it. you're not actually gonna recreate the, when you train it, when you train the encoder decoder, you're expecting to get the exact same image out. So you're trying to get a good set of features in this Z that's in a compressed space that represents the image. Um, so yeah, you expect to get the same image out when you're training the encoder decoder. Up here, you're um, using the encoder to map it into a, a latent space, and then we're finding some other latent, some other coordinate in that latent space that is considered to be in distribution, um, and then you're projecting that back in the latent space. So in this example, I would not expect X and X um, prime to be the same. Uh, yeah, you answered my question. Oh. Is, is that right, Dave? Yeah, is that right, Dave? Did I say that correctly? Uh, the generative so, model certainly doesn't create the same. I, I didn't hear. Uh, so uh, I, I know you started by saying that the encoder and decoder are trained separately and that during training you learn the latent, uh, but during, uh, uh, image generation, you start with some noise and then it will generate that and you could have text guiding it in some direction if needed be, uh, if needed. But what was the exact point? Sorry, after that. Uh, well, around... the, the image that you generate in this. I mean, that, that was it, right? Is on the, on the encoder side, you're using, uh, uh, sorry, decoder using noise, right? So at, at, at a, in a sense, you kind of answered it, Dev, immediately, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, and what they are showing here is just one block. And therefore, you see that ZT and ZT minus one, and that repeating repeating T minus one times in there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, with that, moving on then. Um, okay, I wanted to do a quick um, coverage of distillation. Um, so my understanding of distillation is that you're you're and the the first cases that I heard it applied is that you're taking um, a large model that's been trained on a lot of data. Um, and you take that, once that has been trained, you then are looking at um, creating a smaller mo model trained on less data, um, and you're trying to uh, achieve the same performance. Um, and you do that by essentially, um, instead of the, lar the teacher model would have been trained on a lot of data with, um, with hard labels. So is it a cat or is it a dog, et cetera? Um, the smaller um, student model will be trained instead of on those labels, although they show this also being trained on labels, but um, 
instead of being trained on the hard labels, it's trained on the soft labels from the teacher. So the teacher will have through, you know, looking at all the images it looks at, it has a distribution. It, it's seen enough to know that, yeah, well, you call this a dog, but I know that particular dog is kind of cat catish. Um, so, so initially, just, just to, just to, sorry, Roger, yeah. initially it was just trained on labels and then they discovered very quickly thereafter that if you instead train it on the features, that you could do a much faster and, and higher, more accurate job. Um, the primary objective being at the top, you have a very complex model with a lot of parameters and at the bottom, you may have a much simpler model. In the really extreme example, early days images, you'd have this like massive ResNet model and you just have a very simple connected layer model at the bottom and try to replicate it. Right. And that, that was the first time I heard when you guys started using it, it was in that fashion. Um, okay, so the one other part I wanted, and I think this is different, the distillation I think is a little bit different here. Um, and this is a, a slide, it's actually from a different paper, CTM, and there's the link to it if you're interested. Uh, where they're modeling it a little bit different, but we've got um, the training here uh, for a score-based model. You're training, you're learning this, this score, which is kind of, um, I think this is representing kind of the slope of that ODE trajectory um, at, or through time. So time across the axis and then uh, probably the, the X uh, is the vertical axis here. And your score function that you're learning is determining the slope at, at all those times. It's actually not quite the slope because it's actually uh, it doesn't have a time component. It'd be just in the X direction, either up or down, a little or a lot, but equivalent to the, the score. Um, steep is a big up and you know, shallow is a little up. Um, in, then when you want to do projection, um, NFE is um, a number of forward equivalents or something like that. Uh, the, basically, the idea is if you take that score function and try to uh, predict an image in one step, um, or not an image, just predict the data in one step, following that score function slope, you don't end up at the right point. So, you, you know, your, your point, you should have ended up over here. Uh, instead, you end up way up here. Um, so using SDE um, or an ODE solver that follows it very closely, you can take little steps along the way and you can follow it and get closer. Um, if you take an, an ODE, you're actually following uh, very small steps and you end up very close. Um, to the, the final distribution um, X. Um, distillation, as I understand it, is a little bit different. So instead of um, learning um, the score function, what you're going to be learning is given a point on this curve, what is the endpoint that that point is going to traject, that is going to go to? Uh, and you learn it for all points along that ODE trajectory. So it, it kind of assumes that I have an ODE that I can follow that can tell me for any point on this trajectory where this is, you know, T or, or noise level. Um, for this noise level and this, this point X, where am I going to end up? Um, and we saw that in the consistency model training was another example of that. They were kind of learning the same thing, a little bit different algorithm, but they learned the endpoint. So um, when you sample it, um, you can take a point on that trajectory and immediately jump to the end in one, one step. That's what the model has learned. Um, and if you have more than one step, what you can do is you can project all the way to the end um, and then add some noise and then project it uh, back to the end again and do that some number of times. Um, the idea being that no matter what, there's, uh, there's going to be an error, uh, discretization error, if you try to project the whole way. So it's going to create some error. Um, you're not landing exactly on the, the data distribution. Um, but as you get closer, that error decreases. So you project from here with a big error, you back up. Now you project from someplace near here, and this projection should be, should be closer. Does that make sense? And Dave, did that sound right? Yes. Thank okay. you. Okay. And CTM, by the way, uh, slightly different. Instead of learning to project all the way to the end, they learn to project from any point on the uh, ODE trajectory to another point on the ODE trajectory. Uh, and then so they don't have to go like all the way to the end, back up and then forward. They just project however many steps you want. They project forward on the, the um, trajectory. And the theory, their argument is that you accumulate less error when you do, to, do it that way, because each time you project forward and back up, you're adding a little bit more noise to it. 
Um, so that's that's what this paper is about. Okay, so does that give us an idea of um, the distillation process? Uh, any questions on that? Okay. Um, and the reason that I brought up this is that this seems, if I'm understanding it correctly, it's a little bit different. Um, here we were trying to learn, the student model trying to learn exactly what the, the teacher model um, was doing. Um, in these cases, when we're doing distillation, when we're, at least when we're creating the distillation models, we're learning um, how to move from a point on this trajectory to an endpoint that's determined by an ODE. So we've taken a real long time to slide along here and learn what the, the correct endpoint is for this, this point on the trajectory. And we're trying to learn from that endpoint. So it's a little bit different than the, the distillation we saw with the student teacher in the, the early days. Questions, comments? Okay, so now we're gonna go back to, and we're actually doing okay here, um, the paper, the paper that started all this. While you're doing that, one of the things that I'll add is that as those types of di uh, distillation progressed, one of the things that we learned was that the descriptive power of the latent variables <clears throat> in the, the student model became increasingly interesting and powerful. And in certain cases, the latent variables of the student model were more dense and more informative than the teacher model in the first place because it actually did a better job of generalizing, you know, you're kind of replacing the max pooling and whatever, you know, normalization that you're using with a normalization that's based in data instead of a normalization that's based in try this hyperparameter and then truncate it. Sally, I'm going to ask a quick question. I don't want to get off track too much then, but I've been wondering when we look at these um, latent diffusion models, um, if the, the way to think of it is that when I do an encoder here, I learn a set of latent features um, in the Z space, right? But yeah. as a, when I'm doing generative, I don't know, I, I know kind of the distribution, you typically try to drive Z to be like a Gaussian distribution for each of the coordinates within that latent space, right? But what I don't know is what's the cross correlation between those latents. And so what I was interpreting this is that the diffusion in the latent space is learning like the, the, the cross correlation between the latents so that it can get the right latent combination um, to be projected back up into pixel space. Does that resonate at all? I mean, at a, at a very high level, I think in general, you want your, your latent, your Z space um, to be as independent as possible because then you've, right. you've kind of captured the, the most descriptive variables. Um, in terms of finding the, the mutual information or correlation between those variables, um, I need to digest that. Today's, I, today's not to I, digest. I think, I think I know what you're talking about. You're talking about like the, the concepts in between the, um, uh, like the ideas in latent or like the, I guess the features inside of latent space. So right. I, uh, yeah, I always think of it like, space. <laughs> yeah, I, I always think of it like a like a big giant library with like each book has its own concept, and then each shelf is like a group of concepts, and then you go around and pick them out, and then like you're talking about like the area in between the shelves. Um, you can explore that a lot if you actually deliberately give it um, things that it was not trained on, particularly negative prompts, um, and it will start producing um, images that are in between mm -hmm. the latent um, features. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's, I think, I think your intuition is correct there. Yeah. Okay. And that's why, um, in the VAE sampling in the VAE does not work as well as a diffusion model, um, where it understands those cross correlations. So, okay. I, again, I, we're on a tight schedule, so I didn't, but I have had that question. So another related uh, question today was, I usually see in the papers that the student does a few percent better than the teacher. Is that what you have generally seen around or? When they compare the teacher and student accuracy, right? The, the student usually has a few percent better. Was that directed and, at Dave or Sally? Yeah, Dave, Dave. Yeah, because okay. he mentioned the space being more denser and the, the student learning a lot more, right? They're not able to differentiate, but the accuracy is higher. 
So it, that that I'm not able to kind of get my head around it. I mean, it seems okay, but why should be a few percent higher? The teacher should probably know everything. What silly, is I, the silly? I think that's being directed at you. Oh, sorry. I yeah, you, no, your prompt comes up, Dave, not Sally. So, <laughs> and Dev comes up as <clears throat> Dave comes up as Dev. So it's kind of confusing. But <laughs> sorry, I I missed the question entirely. I apologize. Just why is um why what's the intuition between behind why a student ends up being better a few percent better than the teacher? Oh, so so because sometimes the, the generalization is actually superior because the generalization has been learned instead of truncated. So so generalization in in the in the bigger model typically comes because of these like really harsh um, uh, um, normalization tools where um, what's his name um, the 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 Google guy always says you know the the worst thing about max pooling and the thing I hate the most about it is that it works so incredibly well. Right, <laughs> and and it's like that, and that's kind of the the the, the intuition is that it, max pooling is this like blunt force tool that no one should ever have to use, and we shouldn't be using, um, but it works so well, <laughs> and so that's how we end up getting generalization. But when you do diffusion or distillation, pardon me, the the generalization is you're forcing it to learn a generalization by reducing the memory space, the parameter space. So that's that's kind of the intuition. And so therefore, anything that it wasn't trained on, the cases that you may have overfit in the in the teacher model, it actually may have learned the shape of the the manifold and the distribution appropriately. Cool. Thanks. Okay, I'm pushing forward again just to try to finish here. So, um, th so this is the paper that got us started that Sally and I started talking about a couple months ago, and Sally got super excited about. But yeah, this includes everything we've ever seen, and and let's do a history recall of history that's extended out to five weeks now. So, um, the uh, the paper there's a link here to a, um, a, a website that where they the stability.ai who sponsored uh, this guy is. Um, they, they cover it and talk about some of the examples. They also have clip drop is a, um, uh, you can run it online. It's a very short um, kind of demo number of iterations, but you can run it there. Um, and the, uh, the paper uh, right here, we'll dive into a little bit um, on the paper uh, as go through, but I'm gonna summarize at the high level first. It also, they have code available. Um, I actually last minute here when I was trying to dig down to one question, downloaded the the uh, the source code onto Dave. Thank you very much for uh, use of your CPU cycles. Um, and just FYI, it was pretty easy to um, download. Um, it worked right out of the box. I just used their README samples and uh, was able to get it up and running very quickly. So uh, Richard, if you're interested in doing them directly, it, um, yeah, really easy. <clears throat> um, anyhow, so. There's the two links, um, and this really is summarizes the whole paper pretty much. Um, the model then that they're going to be doing, they're trying to train um, this theta model, the ADD student, um, and the process that they're using uh, has a couple elements. Uh, the loss function includes two uh, elements, a distillation loss and a um, discriminator loss. So. Um, Going back to when we were talking about GANs, GANs where we saw um, discriminator networks before, uh, the idea is that you have um, a generator and you have real data and you sample from both of those and then try to get the discriminator to learn uh, which is the real image and which is the one that you generated. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's what this, this fee uh, discriminator network is doing. Uh, this will be learned as part of the training process. Um, and instead of a GAN where we would um, just sample from a latent space, um, if I remember, uh, instead of that, what we're doing is we're taking the real image, or I don't know if it's the real image here. It implies that it's the real image. I don't know if it's the real image or a real image. But anyhow, we take, um, let's say, the real image, and we do a forward diffusion process. That's where we add noise. Um, and then we ask this ADD diffusion model um, to produce a model from that noisy image. Um, and then we ask the discriminator, so which one's real? Um, and it's got to learn to do that as the generator gets better, you know, then the discriminator has a harder time and it has to learn and then it gets better and it goes back and forth game theory until these, 
these two were at uh, what's that what's that balance point? Uh, equilibrium. Yeah. Equilibrium. Yeah, but what's the equilibrium called? There's a term for it, isn't there? Hmm, somebody's in the equilibrium. Um, anyhow, so that's uh, the diffusion process through theta uh, with a discriminator. But um, in addition to that, um, we are doing it a distillation process where we are um, taking the image. Now, it's a little curious. Um, they take the generated image from the ADD student and they noise that and then ask it to project back into pixel space. Um, I don't know that I fully understand why they start, why they noise the generated image other than instead of the original image. Uh, Sally and I kind of, um, we kind of posited that it's because um, we're trying to train it to get to someplace close to where, like this model got somewhere near the, the uh, manifold, data manifold, but not quite. And we're trying to get the, the um, DM teacher to tell it what point near where you landed is actually on the manifold. Um, and that's somewhat reinforced by the loss function. They, they tend to weight um, small um, noises, noising uh, forward diffusion of this image more heavily than, than long ones. So um, I think it's, it's just trying to pick, it, pick a point that's close to where you actually ended up. And there's, it's easier to learn, I guess, from that. Rather than if I had started back from this one and projected forward, I might have ended up quite a bit different and then that maybe doesn't help. The distance that they're using, um, I think if I recall, this actually is not in pixel space, it's in feature space, but we'll look at that. And the CT is the weighting this is what I'm talking about. They use like an exponential weighting. So ones that are close or more important um, add more to the loss function than ones that are very different. Um, I mean, I think the oh. key word that you said there, just, just to emphasize that we kept kind of coming back to is this concept of the manifold of reality, right? And that you basically have these two different approaches that are coming there, one which is an adversarial approach and the other that's a distillation approach. And that again, kind of that, that it's, it's actually very similar to the question that was asked earlier about like why I think distillation is so cool is that you are getting this, this generalization that again, it, assuming there is some manifold called reality, which there, there may or may not be, that's like a philosophical question, but like assuming that there is, you're basically kind of converging at the generalization of that manifold from two very distinct directions. Mm -hmm. one, one being something that's trying to discriminate very explicitly, am I on this manifold or not? That's the adversarial loss. And then the other one being, how do I, uh, how do I imitate? This is an imitation behavior, which is the distillation loss. Yeah. Um, I wanna correct myself. Um, the distillation loss is actually a pixel level uh, L2 loss. Um, the feature one that I was talking about, we'll see that in the loss functions later, was in the discriminator. Um, so uh, let's see. So the other thing here is that in in this case, the uh, they have a certain number of steps that are different than the number of teacher steps. Um, and I think uh, it, they're rather dramatically different. Uh, I think there was five steps or something like that that they used here. Um, Tau was normally... I, I, maybe we'll see it a little bit later, but whatever it is, it was m very much smaller than the thousand steps uh, in the the uh, DM teacher. Um, okay, so loss functions again, it's going to be the adversarial um, and some sort of weighting of the distillation. Uh, so this is the teacher model, um, and uh, uh, here the adversarial. This is where the features come in. So. They're trying to discriminate. This is the adversarial uh, formula here where they're trying to, um, this is the fake image. So they, they have a fixed feature network. I forget which network they use, but they, have, they extract the features from the image, the real image and the generated image, uh, and they run the discriminator on those features. Um, and you're trying to minimize uh, in this case, so let's see, which is it? You're gonna try to, minimize the, the uh, 
the discriminator is going to try to minimize the probability that the fake one is real um, and try to maximize this because the, the minus sign, uh, you're going to min minimize the negative. So you're going to try to maximize the, the um, probability that the real um, image is classified as, you know, as real. Um, so that's kind of a standard GAN um, uh, adversarial loss function that we've seen before. Um, this guy, the um, R1, I looked that up. Yeah, R1 basically is a way of stabilizing apparently the discriminator. And it looks like it's, it's kind of a uh, L2 um, uh, minimization, regularization of the, dis the gradient of the discriminator. So probably kind of how how peaky that that discriminator is. I don't I don't know the math exactly, but uh, this apparently has the effect of making it easier to train. There's the link to the paper if you're interested. Um, and then the distillation loss um, here is going to be the weighting. This is again, um, as I understood it, weights more heavily the small um, t. So you back up a little ways. Those are the ones that are most interesting. Um, pixel space difference between the original model and the teacher generated model uh, through that uh, X hat C. Um, and stop gradient just means you don't pop propagate the gradient back into the, um, uh, the student generated model. And T would be sampled uh, from that one to 10,000. So that's kind of the loss function in the architecture. Um, and that pretty much captures everything. The, the one part that I, I haven't been able to completely get is that um, these models uh, can do one to n steps. So I think what's what's happening is um, in these cases we we'll, we will sample from how noisy we want to go, and we will project all the way um, to the full image, um, and then. Uh, we will take that image, conditionalize it, and project forward again with a smaller noise sample. Um, so I think it depends on whether we're training on single step or end step. Um, and, uh, and I think that the teacher is, is going to be the same way. I'm not quite sure if the teacher, I think what it means is that um, you might be comparing like a one step my guess is the teacher is going to have to be multiple steps so that it's got a better, higher quality to teach the student. Um, so you do a few iterations of this, and then um, you can compare the the uh, the results of the teacher that's taken a lot of steps to the student that's only taken a few few steps. And you're trying to teach the student how to be as high a quality uh, with fewer steps. That's as close as I can get. Dave, Sally, anybody want to add anything to that? That is correct. Uh, teacher, as they shown on the top in the center, is ten thousand. It's a thousand steps always, and it's a locked model, so it's not learning anything. So that stop grad that you see on the right okay. bottom side is making sure that the loss is not going through this path, uh, and the, all you're doing is focused on learning the middle, whatever that shape is for ADD student, either. Right. And two losses that contribute to that learning is that fee uh, discriminator contributing to it and the distillation loss contributing to it. And yeah. you could be training it for a different number of steps or maybe training it for all the steps, but then you can decide to use uh, whatever number of steps you want to use later right. on. Okay. Yeah, the student the student really becomes kind of the flexible to, 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 to Deb's point. You can, you can do it, all of them if you want, all the steps, or you can do just a couple of them. Um, and and I if it if it's helpful I can just I, I remember now the conversation that we had about why the teacher is the input for the teacher is a noise added version of the output of the student for the loss calculation mm -hmm. and and it and it's essentially that if you if you think about um, the the image generated by the student. What the teacher is trying to do, this is the model on the bottom, which you're, you're saying is kind of your perfect model. What you're essentially trying to do is you're trying to find what is the point on the manifold of reality that would be modeled by the teacher that is perfectly orthogonal and minimal distance, meaning it's the, it's the minimum distance between this image, uh, the, the astronaut with like the gray in the background on the, on the right, What's the distance between 
that image and the manifold that the teacher would generate that, that represents all the image space that the teacher might generate. And by perturbing it just a little bit, you're you're essentially telling the teacher, you know, search this space that's as close nearby. to possible, the nearby. Um, it's not a perfect nearest neighbor. You're you're, you're not going to be able to compute that because it's a it, it's um uh to, to uh, the the comment earlier. It's not a deterministic uh, differential equation. It's a stochastic one, and so therefore you use noise to get the closest proximal value to compute the distance between those two. And that's how you, you use that as the distillation loss. To, to Dev's comment, um, again, then whether you took 20 steps or a thousand steps to do that in the student model is, is kind of uh, extraneous to the whole point. Really the key thing is that you have the, again, these two losses training it towards what you want. And that, and that sorry, just that triggered why specifically you don't use the original image and adding noise to that for the student because you're trying to keep the, the, the loss computation to be locally relevant to the student in this particular case. And if you use the original image, you may find the incorrect point on the teacher's manifold and you may exaggerate the, um, the loss unintentionally. Yep. Yep. So is there any relation okay. in the noise that, uh, sorry. I just wanted to add that uh, when they say the number of steps, like T1 to, uh, to Tn or 1 to 1000 on the top middle part, that's the amount of noise uh, that they're injecting. And that's why they call it S, X subscript S. So they are randomly, I'm assuming in the algorithm that, uh, I don't know if you have a slide on the actual algorithm, uh, Roger, later on from the paper, if they had one, uh, but sometimes they have the pseudo uh, code. Mm -hmm. So... I'm assuming this they, they select some small s as they show on the top uh, from this range. Uh, so you add that noise and you're training uh, your s x to generate from the student whatever x theta hat is. And that's why it's a function of x s, which is your original noisy image, depending on the number of steps that you generated. And s is the function for that. And then you add noise for the corresponding time because your teacher is trained on the time steps, the T time steps. Yeah. And then you uh, generate for the T that you have selected randomly between 1 to 1000. And you will take, uh, as you was saying, those number of steps. And that's why that loss has the, uh, on the on the far right for distillation loss, it has this function CT because it depends on time T. Right. So, so that's what you're trying to do. Yeah. That's where you're weighting ones that are are small um, distances away, small amount of noise added are weighted more heavily than ones that went backed up a long ways. Um, the, the pixel loss, uh, L2 loss is not as important for those. Oh. Right, and that's how you're generalizing for different S and P. Okay, so um, the one last question on this, and uh, Dave, may, maybe you have some insight here, is that th what the comment is that, um, diffusion models often are a little bit blurry. Um, and what they find is that by adding GAN, they get that last bit of um, detail to them. Uh, GANs are, are, are good, but they're, they're unstable to train. Diffusion's a lot more stable to, to train, but for some reason, diffusion has this kind of uh, blurriness to it. And I don't know if you have any insight to the blurriness. I can see why, the GAN, the discriminator, can force you to not be blurry because if the image is blurry, it's not real. So it's got to, it drives it to be sharper. I just didn't quite understand why distillation would be blurry. So I don't know the answer to that. I assume okay. that uh, the in the picture that you showed for LDM, the latent diffusion model from that paper, uh, uh -huh. which is a latent diffusion paper, uh, there it uses the VQ... Oh, maybe it uses VQ VAE and not VQ GAN because if it was VQ GAN, then it's not essentially a GAN GAN, but it's the pixel. Uh, what is that pixel GAN that they use there? So it's not the same GAN as the GAN that we have here. So there is some mechanism I know in the decoder to kind of generate sharp images for VQ GAN. In VQ VQ VAE, if you use just that, you are right that, and we know that from VAE also, right? there could be some blurriness. And with VQ, VAE, because you're quantizing, 
some of that blurriness should go away. And with Discriminator, it should become not just non-blurry, but also more coherent, if you may. Right. right. So one of the things that, that also in distillation, distillation generally will, it has a central tendency. And so it will generally blur things. So it's it um, mm. when, when you're using a distillation loss, um, you know, in, 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 the, in the kind of simplest zero dimensional example, if I guess 0.5 all the time uh, and my teacher is kind of throwing numbers at me from a Gaussian, I'm going to do OK. Right. Uh, and so distillation by it's just by the nature of kind of what you're doing will tend has a has a general tendency to to noisy uh, to, to blur things and noisy things. And, and I'm talking about from a classification perspective, I've never seen distillation used for generation. So I have to, but I have to imagine that the same, that same principle applies. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Great point. Okay. Wonderful. So um, let's, uh, the only thing left here is then kind of the results um, in here. They're just showing um, the user preference. They're comp comparing uh, the one-step model of image quality and prompt alignment against various other models. So XDXL with 50 steps, uh, some of these other guys with, with um, whatever, uh, one-step style GAN. It's, you know, the red means, when the red crosses this, this line, it means it's, it's much better, it's more likely, much more likely to be, to be selected as higher image quality. Um, and prompt alignment. So one step you can see that performs um, pretty well. Um, it doesn't perform as well as um, the ADD four step. And so the next one they do is ADD four step and they compare that against um, higher step counts for other ones. So the, the four step model wins against SDXL 50 step um, in both prompt alignment and image quality. So it's these are just there's lots of red, it's all good type of thing. Four steps seems to beat what used to be 50 or 150 steps. Even these few step models, it does better than few step models. Okay, it's good. Um, this is an ELO representation, so they're showing it as um, inference speed is, is vertical, so down is lower is better. Uh, ELO is a ranking system between models. And I think it was originally developed for chess, um, and it's a way to have a score that represents who's more likely to, to win in a head-to-head -head competition. Yeah, it's like a scaling um, uh, comparison. If you face off against somebody with a really high score, then you gain more, way more points. Right. If you win. If you yeah, win. if you win. If, yeah. you lose, if you lose, you know, it's not so bad because that's the expected outcome. But if you win, it's good for you and bad for them. So, anyhow, so, Dennis also does that, right? If I'm not mistaken. It could be. It, it seems like it's any time you have head-to-head -head competition um, that it's a way of, of ranking um, your actors in, in a one-on-one uh, -on -one competition scenario. So anyhow, uh, what they're saying is uh, the ELO rating for the ADD four-step is above all of these other competitors, and it's not quite as fast as the one-step, but it's, um, you know, lower than than um, all of these these other competitors here. 16 step, four, I guess it's on par with LCM. So it's good and it's fast and you can do it in just a few steps. And then they had some um, examples and I don't know why I must have accidentally slid that image over. Um, the examples are super fun to look at. If you wanna just take a second though, because yeah. it, it, it really does a great job I think that the authors did a good job of selecting the examples to kind of tell the story of, of what they're trying to accomplish here. Oh, shoot, 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 shoot. Okay. Um, I can't, how do I exit this um, mode? Do you know? Uh, Is this, uh, you're trying to exit the view mode in? Um, yeah. yeah. Escape? Escape. F11. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> in this, this one, it looks like I slid the image over so it wasn't in. Okay. Okay, so Sally, I'm gonna let you walk these through because I, I wasn't getting as much out of the images, but you obviously did. <laughs> After you finish that bite. <laughs> I'm eating fun. <laughs> this was so what, what yeah. I thought was fun 
about the the various examples. Um, let me see if I can pull the specific things that I thought were um, were useful here. Uh, I don't think it was these ones. Hold on, let me let me pull up my own slides here. These are the two that I did. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I'm just going to, I'm zooming back so I can look at the slide deck here for just two seconds. Okay. Since you, you put me on the spot here. I wasn't ready. <laughs> um, did you make a copy of this deck? Is that, or did we put this at the beginning? We put this at the beginning. Didn't we? Uh, I, I didn't, yeah, I didn't post, post it again today. Uh, this is actually, no, this is a variation. This wasn't on your deck. This was um, a separate one. I'll, I'll get it posted. Okay. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, Let's see, Excel Turbo. While he's looking for that, um, any uh, audience participation? Anybody have any questions, comments, et cetera? No, except the quality of these is pretty amazing. You know? Yeah, and, and these are all four step, and I did notice that a big difference in four step versus one step. But, um, <laughs> the interesting I, I thing is, if you run them for like 20 or 30 steps, they get even better. Oh, really? Yeah. So if, if I can uh, if I can share Roger, it was the um, sure it was the video on the Stability AI website was the the thing I wanted to okay. share actually. Okay. Oh, Sora. Okay. Oh God, yeah. Oh wait, no, no, Stability. That's uh, the yeah. that's yeah. not Sora. Sora is also amazing, but uh, can I share here? Or uh, uh, Roger, can you allow sharing? Yeah. Pretty please. Uh, why is it not sharing? Loud mother. Sorry, I don't know that why that isn't. Uh... Okay, how about that? Will that work? That looks good. Okay. So what was impressive with this to me was they show some of the real time examples. Um, and the the speed and the, again the speed quality right like seeing it on that that chart was cool but what I found really compelling. There, there's a couple things you notice as they're changing and and uh, editing the prompts. The first that I think is really interesting is the robustness. Um, meaning the, the 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 prompt to prompt robustness is I delete a word and then I I modify it. You're not seeing these massive variations in the pose and everything with the with the animal. That there appears to be kind of a central again like some sort of a central tendency towards consistency and you know that that can be seen as a positive thing or as a negative thing. But when I watched this, especially having <clears throat> kind of comparing it with some of the other algorithms that when they're brand new or coming out, uh, object detection being a really good example, the robustness was where they failed. Maybe they got good results, of, you know, and, and again, this kind of goes to the shape, what was it, visualizing the loss landscape, right? That the shape of these loss curves, as we bring all this together, the adversarial loss, diffusion, um, whether it's clip or, you know, somehow shaping the text prompt and the embedding and distillation, as we brought all those things together, we've actually been able to also maintain what appears to be <clears throat> something of a robust lost landscape that doesn't jump all over the place. And that's, so, so I'm gonna play that video again, just cause I think that was, that was the visual that to me really, really blew my freaking mind. Um, uh, maybe I should go to YouTube and watch it there. Then we can go bigger, there we go. And we can watch an ad together. <laughs> We should get paid for the ads, don't you think? Like we should get like a, a participation. <laughs> there we go. Sponsorship. And, and so again, I think the, the the intuition that I had there, <clears throat> and I don't know if it's if it's correct or not, but it, but essentially that. If one just had adversarial loss, for example, typical GAN stuff, that it would be precise. But but as as we've seen with GAN, they're not necessarily um, um, robust, consistent over over time. And the the intuition that 
maybe just because it's my personal favorite technology, is that maybe the distill the distillation in that ability to generalize, that ability to kind of see the actual shape of the manifold may actually be enabling that type of consistency to be happening frame over frame. So that was that was I, the most interesting so, thing. Sally, I think one other element of but in the paper they talked about an advantage of this model is that um, you know it's a um, noisy image in and, and a, a denoised, somewhat denoised image out. So the dimensionality of the input and the output are the same, which makes it suitable for iteration. So um, when you're going, when you're typing, um, your your generation is conditioned not only on the text but also on the prior image. I think so that that'll be contributing to some of the stability as as well. Ah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Good observation, uh, Roger. I don't, I think that, I'm going to just look at the slide here. I think that that is really, we've kind of wrapped up. Yeah, we have kind of wrapped up um, the uh, paper. Um, we can go through the uh, paper a little bit. That there's some highlights in there, but none are super consequential. I think what I'd like to do is instead um, jump over, let's see, hold on one second. Um, so, what, again, as I was trying to answer this question about um, uh, how does this, this actually work, the diffusion actually work, uh, share screen, I should have this guy. So if I'm lucky, let me not do that one because that was pretty lame. So um, the code was uh, at the top of the paper, there was a reference to the GitHub. Um, I just, and this was just kind of last minute, um, cloned that off, followed through the um, the readme. Uh, in here they had some um, sample. Uh-oh. Oh, okay. Um, what was the original prompt there? Was that Gandalf as an archbishop? Was that the... Um, we'll see that. So in here they have a um, a wizard, AI wizard, photorealistic detailed AK. Mm. Okay. Um, so and every and, wizard looks like Gandalf, apparently. <laughs> it's the best representation we have. So this is, this repository isn't just Turbo XL. Um, it is the stability AI generative uh, uh, the repository. So it's got other things like it's got the 3D. Uh, I think this is generating 3D models that then you can, you know, zoom around. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Um, I haven't played with any of these others. Here's some 3D. You generate the 3D and then you you, Richard. different views on them. Um, I haven't played with that, but we're hey, that's SV3D. That. That, that's it right there. Yeah. Yeah. S SV3D. Yeah. I haven't played around with that one yet, but that's on my list. Yeah. So this they just cool. announced this week, right? Yeah. That's Freaking crazy Blue. good. Part That's 18. so good. Yeah. That's wait, wait, so can... cool. I haven't seen it before. I just, I, I started reading the paper, but oh my God, that's so cool. So yeah, the movies they... that are being generated, I assume, are not, they're not like AI generation. It generated a 3D model and then you're just using. Um, I don't believe that's the case. I, I, it, I believe it generates the, the, it generates the entire space. Like it creates a yeah. mental map of the whole thing. You, you like walk through it like a video game. <laughs> And a pro really? projection as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the paper. I, I again, I've I've only started reading it, but the, the the contribution essentially is that no, it's not cheating. Yeah, it's like literally making a an uh like a its own version of the world. Wow. And then it's, it's maintaining consistency f across frames then and everything. Well, there's no like frames. Like you are basically putting a camera into its universe and then moving around and taking and filming it. Oh, okay. So, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. That is so pretty it, impressive. So the generation is conditioned some, somehow on this the view angle and distance and everything and position. Sure. And then it generates it based on that conditioning. No, it's kind of the opposite. It like. It creates the entire world and then you put a camera in and then you are filming it regardless of like it creates the entire space and it, then you you are just a visitor in the space and seeing it from the a particular answer perspective. is in the title um so so sv3d is kind of a little bit uh it, it, it's a little tricky the actual title is novel multi-view synthesis so essentially you get a single image it extracts the three-dimensional space 
from that image and then generates a novel view from it. So you start with like one picture of the green train and then it, it actually fills in the rest of that and generates the other images. So there's not a, like a 3D model that then you're viewing using kind of standard math. You're actually, it has some internal representation and you're asking it to, to show me a view from a different angle. Yeah, you basically just like, hey, I found this this picture of a horse toy. What do you think the rest of it looks like? Can you show me what it looks like from the other side? And it, and yeah. that's literally what it's generating. Okay. It, it's just like if you're playing a video game and you like move around a map, it's very wow. similar to that. Wow. So but you only get to you only get to do all that based on having seen the one scene from the right uh, from right. the one picture from the one perspective. That's crazy. <laughs> that is crazy. So so Roger, like nerfs, you need to give it like 20 pictures originally, but it's the same thing where you tell it what camera angle you want and it'll generate an image for you based on its internal representation. But again, the camera angle is going in, in as a condition on the, the generation of an image, not into like something that translates 3D to 2D. Let me say it this way. The model is generated without any camera image info once you decide you want a, uh, a, a JPEG, then you tell it the camera angle that you want to view that scene from, and it gives you a JPEG. Relative to your original perspective. Wow. So, so every, everything, everything yeah. again, kind of comes from one perspective. I, I started here, Crazy. now just move this way and tell me what it looks like. Rotate 180 degrees around, and then tell me what it looks like. And so you don't have to have a base point of, you know, kind of, kind of universal reference. There's no universal, um, three-dimensional model that you're starting from, everything starts from, the entire process starts from a single image. Wow. Right. But the, the, the I think the answer to your question is the camera angle is not part of the training process. It happens gotcha. afterwards. Gotcha. Cool. Cool. So that sounds pretty exciting. And given how easy it was to, to indu, um, install and run Turbo, uh, uh, SDXL Turbo, I'm hoping this is going to be equally easy to install uh, and run that. that yeah, think. Hugging Face is making everything so simple now. Yeah. Nice. Okay, but we're way back here on the boring stuff, uh, SDXL Turbo. Um, and so here's some models that they, images they generated. And um, I think they. I have the, that's XDXL video. I have that. Um, that's what I made the eye. Oh, that was with. video, not. Oh, that, yeah, no, the, the one that's moving in the bottom. Yeah. 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 That's um that's XDS. It's really good. Um it, you you don't even have to like right out of the box the model works like those pictures. Really? That's insane. That is so cool. So anyhow, this guy, um, I just went in and um so that wasn't where I got the code. Somewhere I saw um whoops, that's gonna jump off to a different place. Um, I guess I followed that link and maybe that's where the, the yeah, that's where the samples were. Um, if you follow this SDX, it won't show up because I'm um, currently showing my uh, VS, um, my VS code. Uh, but if you follow that link, they had some pr prompts and I just cut and paste those basically. Um, and this is the, this is the text that generates images. Um, and if you run this, so we can play with different ones. Um, this is with two inference steps. Um, if I run it with um, like four inference steps, then it goes through and it'll generate. And I also put a little loop in here to, to do four and we print out the amount of time. So 4X take on this machine, which is uh, 4090. I think it's only using one of your 4090s, Dave, um, is a third of a second or so. Um, to generate each of the four sec images. And if we just go look ahead and see how those sample, I mean, they're, they're pretty, pretty cool. Oops. And every weather yeah, wizard still looks like Gandalf. Yeah. Dumbledore is acceptable as well though, I think. Uh, yeah, that's true. And yeah, but Dumbledore looks like Gandalf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there went a little Asian on that one though. So, you know. <laughs> Hey so. now, hey now. Silly. <laughs> I don't know what guidance that is going to provide, but we'll see. Oops. Oh. 
<laughs> Sorry, it's <still waiting. laughs> You gotta be careful. You want to tell us about this other life you have? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I, guess, I guess he's interested in whoever the heck this person is. So famous. They did a really well, bad job. You get on your name on there, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, barely. The text is so so, right? Yeah. Um, what was hey, well, the, that's the improvement, though. Usually you can't read the text in these yeah, things, it's right? It's some screwy ass yeah. thing. So. Yeah. Since SDXL, it's been getting better. Yeah. 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 Um, I curious. They also had in that uh, little readme they had a, um, a image to image, and I tried that. So I got a picture of uh, Andre Carpathy and tried to convert him to an AI expert, and um, it was a little image to image with people and keeping retaining the faces really hard without like control nets. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, then that that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This this didn't work near as well. That looks um, a little cartoonaroony here. Yeah, I, so I don't know what the. Uh... You want to um, lower the uh, the noise uh, denoising on the la on the second step of the image to image. Um, if you're using the SDXLs, otherwise just like use like 0.2 percent denoising, and then you'll keep retain the original image. Where's the denoising? Uh, it's a it's a it's just one that isn't listed there. You can just put it in. Uh, and do you want to increase the guidance scale? Something like that? What's this? Is uh, I think it's, um, let me double check. No, I did, definitely didn't find it, so. Yeah, but uh, how about that guidance scale? Can you increase that and see if that helps improve? Well, it mm. used to be 0.0, .0 is what the stock, what the example was. Um, yeah, but is it is it a zero to one type thing or is it a I zero don't actually know. I haven't. It's, what if it's, you put uh, I didn't get a chance to play around with it very much. Yeah. I believe the highest for the because that's CFG. I think like it's like it usually goes up to like thirty. Yeah. Um, you usually want it it's... around around like if you're on the really fast ones, you want it at like point one, point two, or like um, a maximum of two with the with the LCMs because for some reason the CFG um, will overcook the image and make it look really weird and have lots of artifacts. Um, because of the distillation process, and I'm not sure exactly how that relates, but um, it's just yeah. Thing. I was thinking one might be too high. Okay, then let's try these. Did Dave change his image? Yeah, he just stole it. <laughs> no, I there's something I'm not understanding. Um, yeah, try try a higher guidance, maybe six or something. <laughs> You get a really crazy image a bit. Yeah, let's see. What well, we're that. getting pretty crazy images already. <laughs> well, yeah, true, true. Oops. Oh. Yeah. Apparently, six is not a good thing. Invalid value or something. I don't know. Blow up is what I'm seeing. It might be scaled. Hmm. A, lot, a lot of people put rescalers on it. Unspecified dimension minus one can wow. be any. So what was strength for? Point five. I think your Selly image generation was much better. I got. I got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know why the condition stuff. Ooh, that's handsome. Yeah. <laughs> Andre Carpathy after his away mission on Star Trek: uh, Deep Space Nine. <laughs> Is that like a Van Gogh portrait of Kapaki? Well, the uh, there's the original, so that's what we're trying to match. Yeah, it's not yeah. good. Yeah, Anyhow, not, I, not um, it takes some playing around with to get. It's oh, it's, it's kind of like a weird up. like felt kind of thing where you just play with the knobs and you basically are like using it like your own um, reinforcement learning. <laughs> <laughs> it's training you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, that's not quite right. It's using you for its own enforcement. <laughs> yeah, right? there you go. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't believe that you're using it at all. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm so, going back to the uh, 